Okay, so that just happened. That was the sound of a meteoroid striking the surface on Mar of Mars Christmas Eve last year. So what does it mean? It's got some very interesting things that's got, that have come out of it. And uh, NASA has been releasing some very fascinating, very interesting stuff over the past few days. Let's uh, bring in Dr. Amitabha Ghosh. Uh, he's a planetary scientist at NASA, associated with the NASA Mars rover program. Dr. Ghosh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Over the Horizon podcast. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. This is phenomenally important, isn't it? Tell us why this is important. Right. Let's begin with what really happened and how this was discovered. Right, right. Um, okay, so let me just first, since you bring, bring it up, why is it important? So, um, so, you know, in my PhD program, I studied the interior of asteroids and how they evolved. So, um, mm -hmm. the um, what you see on the top of a surface of a planet is really very, very little in terms of volume. So the interior really right. defines as to how that planet or asteroid evolved. Yet mm -hmm. we've, we've had all these surface missions to Mars and photographs, etc. But everything was a surface and we didn't know anything about the interior. So this mission mm -hmm. called InSight was conceived um, in the 2000s. And then, you know, it took shape and then it landed in 2018. So really, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Earth, um, it has a core, it has a mantle, it has a crust, and there's a very specific sequence, composition. Um, it is really the history of Earth is the history of the interior. Yet we knew nothing mm. about the interior before this this mm. uh, InSight mission was sent. And the mandate of the, the interior insight, of Mars. Interior of Mars. So mm. this mission, which measured this um, meteorite impact is is insight mars insight it's a mission which was sent explicitly to study the interior of mars in terms of what is the heat flow are there mm. earthquakes inside so so it's a fascinating window into something we never knew is mars as active as uh, as the earth is does mars have plate tectonics mm -hmm. i don't know whether mm -hmm. you're aware of plate tectonics and on earth yeah all, all yeah. the plates are moving constantly yeah um yeah right so um so is that the same process on Mars. Hmm. Um, so, um, so that is the backstory of why this mission is even important because we're trying to understand okay, how Mars so formed. Okay, so NASA was looking out for this. So NASA was was waiting and watching, and this was a big one. I think it was a magnitude four point oh or something of thereabouts. Am I correct? Right, right. right. But let me correct you. NASA was not looking out for this. See, unlike oh really? Okay. Uh, uh, unlike you know, when you think of scientific discovery, it is always accidental. You cannot mm. see, you cannot, you have to keep your eyes and ears open and then something comes up and there's a surrounding reason hypothesis. That is how it plays right. out. It is always serendipitous. So um, <laughs> the, the, the whatever, whatever happened here was very interesting in the sense that, you know, on Earth, you hear of earthquakes happening in Thailand and mm. uh, Southern California and uh, everywhere, right? And so how, how is that? Right. How does that work? So you have geophysical laboratories. So, you know, I have some, mm -hmm. a few of my friends who worked in geophysical laboratories and they have things called right. seismometers. They are instruments right. that can measure the waves that travel through the Earth, right? Mm -hmm. so, so say, you know, we are... A couple of geophysicists and we are at a uh, South Pacific Island and we are watching some se seismometers there and then you suddenly pick up these vibrations coming from maybe, I don't know, uh, the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So you know an, an earthquake right. has happened. Right. right. So and, and, and there's a definite sequence. There is something called P waves which travel directly, then S waves which again travel after that, and then surface waves mm -hmm. which travel through the surface. So then you right. know it's an earthquake, and so this happens. All is this happening all the time on 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 Earth? Right. So somebody monitoring. It. Yeah, with so, and exactly with, which, that's that uh, that that so was which, what I was about to ask you. Is so you know there's there there's as you rightly said uh, there's there's always earthquakes happening on Earth, and they're of different varying magnitudes. Is it the right. same on Mars? So that is what we did not know, right? We are going to ah, study okay. Mars. We don't even know, right? So like the fascinating thing about Mars. 
say you're traveling through the atmosphere, but no one has traveled through the atmosphere before. So you don't know the density structure. You don't know the temperature gradient. You don't know the pressure structure. You know nothing. Mm. If you think of, uh, so, so for similarly in this situation, nobody has ever monitored a Mars quick. So this is the first time uh, something is happening. So imagine you were like a seismologist there on Mars and you're happy yeah. to the ins- ha- listening to the insight. And then you hear this three things that uh, three waves, the P wave, the S wave and the surface wave. And then right. you deduce that there is an earthquake that happened. And one of the fun things is not only can you, can you hear the, um, the waves, you can also pinpoint the location after that by, right. by something called inverting the data. So mm. now, you have, uh, yeah, so inverting is, you know, I'll give you an example of inver- inversion. So when you do an ultrasonogram, right? right. Um, or you use seismic to um, look for oil. So to, right, to recreate right. the structure below the earth. So you use models that would produce, so you don't know what exact layering is. So you try out various layerings and you find out one which best fits the data. So right. here also by inverting the data, you find the um, location of the earthquake. So that mm. happened and you know they went and published their data and announced to the world. And then the other team on, on another mission unrelated to this, which had been mm. on Mars from 2006, high rise mm. mission, you know, they give a lot of data. They, they essentially take pictures of Mars. Right. A very, very high resolution pictures. So they noticed that there's something weird is going on and one location seems that there was an impact. Right. And they give the location of the impact. And now it happened that the mm-hmm. location found by Insight matched the location where these people are saying that there was a um, meteorite uh, crater. So mm-hmm. now the story changed from it's not an earthquake generated in the interior, but an earthquake caused because a meteorite dropped on the surface. So, I see, right. So, so, right. So it's f- fascinating to be, see, the, the real fascinating part of science is the time when you say, I don't understand, and this doesn't make sense. So you right. know, there's not, never a eureka moment. See, one thing is, in other facets of life, it's always people are very, very confident. For a scientist, okay. there is always uh, uh, like 20% error bar, 10% error bar. So, so it's a process of thinking. Hmm. So blocks of water ice, I believe, were discovered. And uh, right. some of them were pretty big. Give us a sense of the size of, um, of what we're talking about here. So I think the crater is about 500 feet. Um, so mm-hmm. to give you an idea, the height of a third, three-story building is maybe 35 feet, 40 feet, right? Right. So you can get, it is like wow. more than 40 stories. So it's, it's, it's a reasonably big crater. Mm. And um, okay, so why is the, so you mentioned ice. So why is the ice important? So before 97, when, when Pathfinder landed on Mars, for 50 years, scientists thought that Mars is dry, very, very dry. There's no water, no ice. Right. So um, then all these discoveries of ice gradually came into, in 2001, we first observed um, uh, hydrogen uh, ions at the poles. Then Mars Phoenix mission landed at the poles, verified that that hydrogen was actually ice. So, Mm. but that was at the poles. So this location is at the equator. And so what we are seeing here Uh, is below the water, below the ground, there is ice. And why is it important? See, we we constantly hear about missions to Mars, human missions to Mars. NASA is planning, China is planning, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, But there's a very big difference between Moon and Mars. Moon is three days away, Mars is seven months away. So hmm. how are you? And you have to, to time it right if it in order to get the shortest time travel period. Yes, yes, you have to time it right. But but the distance differential is huge. So you cannot hmm. carry all the water uh, for human consumption and all the rocket fuel required. So you know, imagine you went for yeah. a journey of two years, um, 
and you're going by plane. And if you had to carry all the water for two years, then yeah, it just would wouldn't be, make sense. It would be very, very expensive. Yeah. So per passenger, there would be like 1,000 bottles of water. So, um, so here, if you do not find water and or ice on the on Mars, the cost would be prohibitively expensive. So, so right now, that is that is why it is very significant. So, so it's not a done deal, but at least you have the right. ice there. You have still you still have to. Okay. So, do we know how much is there? I mean, because as you said, you know, you started off with a kind of an assessment. Okay, that there's there's uh, there's there's water ice at the poles. But you, but now this is at the in the equatorial region, and this is. Uh, I'm just going to pull up this um, animation. This is from 2019, I believe, and the area that's you can see the ice cap of the pole, and then this that's marked out this area. Uh, yeah. This is upwards. This is in the northern hemisphere. So there's also the huge uh, variations in temperature. There's also a big question of accessibility, and when you talk about habitation and Maybe even terraforming, uh, terraforming, uh, sometime in the future. The availability, the, the easy availability uh, of water ice or water, is a big determining factor, isn't it? So how how huge is this that you've found water in the equatorial region and not very deep? Right, right. So, so you know, you we are in this process of discovery. I wouldn't really term anything as huge. Um, so we're finding different data at different places. So, so where this is important is that we never thought under the ground there would be um, so much ice hmm. because it's hot. The equator is hot. So, hmm. um, so, so just hang on. Earth, when you say hot, what, what exactly do you mean? Is it like relative, earth hot or? No, it's not that hot, but it is hotter than the ports, you know, where it is permanent, okay. permanently frozen. So mm -hmm. when we talk of quantities, uh, like mm, on Earth, you have water under the ground. It's not that, you know, that abundant. But the fact that even a little bit is there is hopeful, mm. because if you see, when we extract, um, so you have to have a metrological process or some sort of a chemical process to take the ice out. So, right. so it should, it, it is still a glimmer of hope here that somehow this would be possible um, to extract the ice. Because okay, so all, can, I, can I ask you to give us, a, for those watching it, to help us understand in kind of relative terms, um, from what scientists know right now, mm -hmm about the quantity of water ice available on Mars, be it at the poles and at the equatorial, everywhere. How much, what sort of, just ballpark figure, what, how, how would you compare that to a water body or not? Would it be a lake? Would it be, uh, surely not 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 like an, an inland, inland not, sea? Not like oceans. It would be probably yeah. the, the whole of Mars might have, I don't know, of a very large lake, a volume of water, I would say. Like okay. Lake Baikal in Siberia, right? So okay. it's I would say a but large that's, lake. That's, that's what that, we that's, know right now. Yeah, and this is a very approximate. Since you asked me this question, it's a very right. approximate and sure, sure uh, ballpark figure. So it may be of much course. lower. It may be much yeah. lower, right? But the fact that even little bit is there is hopeful. Well, it's certainly a lot more. If 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 it's anywhere near, let's say Lake Baikal, it's a lot more. Uh, let me say that there's a, there's a lot so more that, possibilities that that maybe exist within the realm of possibility than previously thought. Right, right. So, so think of the surface area of Mars is almost equal to the surface area of Earth, right. land area. So it's a right. huge am amount of area. So, so it means that in any given area, the amount of water is not perhaps that abundant. But from mm. going from zero to at least something is a big deal. And sure. there is there is uh, radar instruments, um, I think, on the Chinese rover, which are looking for ice under the surface as well. So right. this is an on ongoing process. But at some yeah. point, um, you have to try to um, get some uh, what we call in situ resource utilization. So you have to get some. Yeah, that. Uh, so how resource. do you go about that? And what 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 would that be like? What would that look like? 
would it well, be mining have, would it be like we have we have um an instrument um in the perseverance rover that mm -hmm. manufactures oxygen from the air right so that is so it's a pilot experiment and if it works there'll be a probably a hundred times bigger instrument to give sure supply more sure. oxygen right sure so think yeah so um so the technology is to be developed now this is on perseverance right on perseverance right right so um speaking of perseverance you know i, I think there are about what a hundred uh, uh, 10.9 or 11 million earthlings whose names are there that was a really interesting i'm i happen yes. to be one of them my daughter happens okay. to be one of them her names okay. are on mars um okay. i think there's so much of of what nasa is doing of what scientists like you at nasa are, are trying to do also is to inspire people here about a you know a possible future amongst the stars maybe just within our planetary system how much within our reach is that? I am not trying to inspire anybody <laughs> that this is possible. So the reason I'm saying it's people perhaps get lost a little bit between um, people perhaps uh, do not realize how far Mars is. Um, right. So, so as I said that, you know, the yeah. moon is probably... Um, 384,000 miles, less than half a million miles. This is like more like 300, 400 million miles, depending on where it is. Yeah. So it's a huge difference. And three days, as you said, to travel. Three to, days was, versus yeah. seven months if you go to the shortest route. Right. Every, every so I think it, it's important for people to folks to kind of wrap their head around the, um, you know, what what exactly is it that we're talking about in terms of time and distance and scale. In our right. planet, in our planetary see system. The, see, the distance analogy is perhaps even more. Uh, uh, it is like ten thousand trips from from New York to Bombay, hmm. right? So going to Mars is ten thousand trips from New York to Bombay. Yeah. So that's how. That's how a lot far of frequent flyer miles. Right. the The problem is if you if with the setting up a civilization. See, the reason hmm. humans were able to colonize and stay in america because you could grow food here you could get water here you could build houses yeah. here so you kind yeah. of need to have that on mars so the yeah. first thing before that but you also don't need it at scale dr gosh you don't need it at scale to begin with right. you could start off small right see but what makes more sense is to start it off in on, on the moon which which is what jeff bezos wants to do so he wants to set up a lunar base on the moon first. On the moon. Before before you go to Mars. So that's yeah. what makes more sense. Um, hmm. And it is very, very possible. See, we, we live in humans have evolved, you know? So humans were what? In, when they started out, they were hunter-gatherers, hmm. right? Maybe 5,000 years ago, we transitioned to the through the agricultural revolution. Right. So humans humans realize that you know you don't have to go from uh, place to place to gather fruits. You can grow yeah. it on one. You place. just grow it. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that, that uh, the agricultural revolution is just I don't know five thousand ten thousand years old, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. when they settled down. And right now, if you look, we live in some of, some sort of a habitation module. So you know we have a roof on the head, we have air conditioning, we have water in our houses. Right. On the moon, the only thing extra is you will also have oxygen. That's all. If you if you're taking a flight, the outside temperature is like minus sixty degrees centigrade. You wouldn't survive. The outside pressure is very low. If somehow yeah. the the plane the doors open, you know the body pressure inside your body is much more than yeah. the pressure outside. So you literally so you explode. Body, you will explode, right? Yeah. So so we live already in many many habitation modules. So yeah. in on the moon, it will be just one more parameter. You know, you would need that air conditioning, that water. Um, and you would need some oxygen. So, which I would, I could even argue that on the plane, you have those oxygen things which drop, right? So, yeah, yeah. In a way, so, so it is absolutely possible. But And I think it's also a question of, of conditioning the mindset. I, th I think hu uh, human beings are pretty conditioned by now to accept a reality 
where they were uh, existing on on the moon or mars or anywhere else uh, of earth would be would necessitate some sort of dependence on a on a respiratory system some sort of dependence on uh, a habitation system that is unique to that environment and not okay. necessarily similar to earth's but i think that that's a that's a conditioning that exists in the yes. population in the mindset yes see i think that is easier to conquer what yeah. is harder to conquer is um, human beings are very social creatures hmm. right how do you deal with loneliness hmm. right so that i think is psychologically something um, you know if someone put you in the middle of space for 3 years 5 years yeah would you be able to you know um, that is a challenge i feel hmm. but there are also physical challenges of human beings being in space in a in an environment of uh, either microgravity or a lack of gravity altogether yes together. which, which is lots of calcium presents, bone structure yeah that right. presents its own challenges right which is a tougher right. challenge to get over i think the i believe medical science can probably slow down that bone loss you can do exercises and somehow um exercise your bones but mm. the loneliness part um or um for the space station see we have circadian rhythms right which is yeah. we feel sleepy and then the space station suddenly it goes around the earth once in 30 minutes so yeah. you have a sunrise and sunset every 30 minutes every 30 minutes so yes. so 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 you're there's a gene you know for circadian rhythm You know, yeah i think like 3 4 years ago somebody got the nobel prize because they isolated the yeah. gene right yeah so so how does the gene deal with that i mean how does it deal with uh, every uh, 30 minute uh, sunrise sunset situation so so these are things which have see we have evolved gradually and mm. through millions of you know millions of years of change from you know from the time we were other organisms we descended so all these yeah. genetic information which is stored into us assumes certain things and you suddenly mm. change that um you cannot adapt in uh 100 years or 10000 years it's a, it's a much bigger change there's so much talk about the future of human space exploration and is it what does it entail i mean what let's talk about the the rover program since you're associated with it what's the future of the rover program where do you, so we've seen the ingenuity helicopter and that was a huge thing the first flying machine on mars we've seen rovers before but the rovers the helicopters they all have mechanical and physical limitations and technological right. limitations so i guess my question is what's the next evolutionary step in the in the rover program when right. you see it in what so let's form? let's just step back and forget about rovers and helicopters and other jargon right yeah. why did we go why did we go to mars you tell me well if if you listen to folks like uh, elon musk it's to ensure no, no, that uh, there's you, a way you, to look you, to ensure that uh, you know the human race can can survive even if there's a a massive uh, meteor that strike or is a a <laughs> civilization ending event of some sort but, but see, you that, tell me that, you're the you're the you're the mass no, scientist no 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 you are the you why are, are the, we there you know <laughs> no so just see that what elon musk said is now but people are sending mars missions from the 90s and um right so so the thought was mm-hmm. um so so let's, let's just even discount what elon musk said like one year right. back or three years right. right what does fundamental science do it they try to understand mm. what's out there and the processes out there so the, i think the initial thought why there was the voyager mission right um in right. 76 it went through all yeah. the all the plan yeah to find out how these worlds are um it's it's a it's it's a fact finding are they similar to earth are they not similar to earth so that was the mandate first and and then it was a very stunning discovery that um, beyond see, the mars program the multiple missions started from 96 and there were many many missions after that and then we realized how similar it is to earth mm. so so the processes the compositions everything is much very similar to earth so so now what could be the next step the next 
the next step was in 96, NASA said, well, let's look for water. And then again, we found water. The next step is um, finding habitable environments where life could survive and ultimately to look for life. So, mm. so if you think... Oh, we're um, getting into the Fermi paradox rain, uh, territory here. Not the Fermi paradox. It is as a... Um, no, the Fermi paradox entails the larger universe. But I'm just talking of Mars. About right the... Uh, okay. Ab and our planetary system. Yes, but just Mars for now. Just uh, okay. If, okay. If, if Mars was like Earth with mm -hmm. oceans mm -hmm. 4,500 million years ago, for, okay. for, for the first 500 or 200 million years, there was oceans. If it was and that is confirmed. Like, that is confirmed because you see those um, evidences of catastrophic floods um, mm. that defines the sculpts the surface of Mars. Right. So now, now if there indeed was Earth-like, and we've and then... and we've learned that by studying Earth's geology, and no, so we have um, by indirectly studying the photogeology. Like, say, if mm. you have, if you if if the if a river was to dry up, mm. it will leave a certain shape on the surface of the Earth, right? Right, exactly. If you if you if you find a similar shape on the surface of Mars, you have to assume. So you that could infer something. that. There was something there. there so okay. now if it was Earth-like, then um, on Earth, maybe life arose after 200, 300 million years ago. So mm -hmm. can, can this, could Mars have also, you know, spawned life? Uh, then um, if it did, did it transfer life from Mars to Earth? Um, they're very, very deep questions. Then about life. Um, mm -hmm. Is it is life a phenomena that if you have water and some range of temperature and some ingredients, does it automatically evolve, mm. or is it a, a process of chance or a stochastic process? Right? Yeah. So they're very very deep answers, and the way that we can address this, and it's, now I'm answering your question, yeah. they will bring back samples from Mars. Right. Um, that is the next goal. So so right now perseverance is scared is collecting samples and putting them in test tubes. And there's mm. another mission which is going to go and get the, them back to Earth. And then you can mm. really do a detailed study of them to see if there are any microfossils, if there are any evidences of life. So that life question is perhaps going to become increasingly important as we go into this decade. But of course, there's a lot of analysis and study uh, before you get to a particular location on Mars to look for something in particular let's say okay. fossils, right? There's a process of uh, filtering possible locations. And I'm sure, um, so I guess if you could take us briefly through the thought process or, or the, the scientific process of how do you decide where to look for something that you're looking for on Mars? Let's say fossils. Why and where right. would you look in a particular place as opposed to another place? Right. So like, Gale crater, right? At, um, where Curiosity landed. So yeah. there's certain locations of Mars. We think there was water there, water and sediments. So those spots are the most interesting places where you would want to carry, take fossils from. But you know, this, I just mentioned microfossils, but you know, it's perhaps a very long shot. Yeah. So if, if uh, there was a visitor to Earth, uh, most of the time of Earth's history was occupied by one-celled microscopic -cell creatures. creatures. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if Mars just developed that, and then four billion and it stopped years there. Are, yes. And these are not hard shells, not calcium shells. So they, yeah. they will likely not be um, any fossils of micro, you know, sure. one-celled creatures, right? Yeah. So, yeah. but is there any other evidence, indirect evidence you can find? So this is where the serendipity comes. And sure. again, the very interesting thing is, if you get some evidence, it means that life was there. If you mm. don't get any evidence, it doesn't necessarily mean life was not That there. life was not there. Exactly. So, <laughs> let, me, so let me ask you this. So in, in the cauldron that where life is born, you need certain mm. uh, elements. Um, and those elements are known to 
have existed and still exist on Mars. So there is a possibility, a very real possibility, that at some point in time in Mars's history, the mm -hmm. conditions and the ingredients may have been just right for organic life to form. Or is it? Right. Am I limiting? Am I limiting the scope when I say organic life as we know it? Right. So, so remember you said something about the cauldron. Yes. The thing is, we don't know what the cauldron was, as the, what the ingredients were. There is multiple theories, which lead to multiple directions. Then we don't know. Um, so imagine there is a block of mud, mm. and imagine an, a one-cell creature with with a mitochondria which is a very yeah. efficient energy producing right. mechanism um then there is chromosomes which uh, and there is genes and information storing and um how did it happen from a very how did the jump from the inanimate to the animate happen yeah and it is possible we are not seeing there must have been a very gradual change and all the evidence in between has been lost. So what we see as the most primitive organism now was actually not the most primitive organism. So the answer to your question is one of the things that we understand the least is the jump from the inanimate to the animate. And it is hmm. very difficult to say, you know, what called. Are there any clues? Have we found any clues yet? Um, see, there are different theories, and but none that match all the data. So there is one about um, iron-based organism, which is mm. which was um, chemoautotrophic, mm. means that um, it derived energy by um, chemical reactions, and then uh, it formed a protocell, a very simplified version of the cell. Mm. So that is one thought. But you know, you will never know. And even for life, we don't know whether the carbon-based life is is the only possible right. What if it was a silicon-based life? Template. Yeah. Yeah. What if it was a silicon-based life? The thing about defining life is we are defining life based on one specimen that we have observed. Not about we are supposed to be defining life based on many, many 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 life forms in different parts of the universe so, so i guess out of, a, yeah so, so ahead, out of a, so the universe has a trillion trillion stars right it has a mm. trillion galaxies each galaxy has a trillion stars so the universe has one followed by 22 or 24 zero stars so if out of a trillion trillion stars um, maybe one percent had life then also That's it's a still huge, a great huge, number. Huge yeah. number. If it was zero point zero 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 one percent, then also that's a huge number. Yes. <laughs> right. So we are supposed to be defining life based on seeing multiple. We haven't encountered anything, and nor can we travel so. Or far shall we say we haven't encountered anything that we've that we have understood or recognized? Um, on Earth, see, on Earth you cannot. We haven't traveled that. Exactly. Far. I mean, there's right. still so much about the depths of the oceans that we're still discovering. See, if if you find life in the oceans, it will be Earth-based life, and it will hmm. perhaps have the same. It might have some different, like it might have bioluminescence, or it might be able to survive under um, very um, high temperature or pH. But it will still have the fundamental structure of mitochondria and chromosomes, and okay. the under underlying cell structure will still be the same. So, hmm. so it's a it's a wide open and thing. and and there have been some weird, uh, uh, some really weird discoveries in lava flows and on, you know, on, on um, undersea volcanoes. Right. So that has been part of our life on extreme environments program at NASA headquarters. Yeah. So yeah. the thing was to go to different uh, places where life was not thought possible. And then you go more and more from Atlantic, uh, sorry, Antarctic ice cores hmm. to um, volcanic vents where it's a very acidic environment. Then you have anaer anaerobic chemo 
autotrophic life means yeah autotrophic means you know it can produce its own energy it's all photo right. autotrophic yes. is the is the tree where the yeah. uh, uh, light comes from uh, the energy comes from photosynthesis here it has to be chemo autotrophic because yeah. beyond the depth of 1 kilometer light yeah, does not is... penetrate yeah the ocean is dark right yeah so so, so yeah so you know it, it's a very new frontier um uh um like um, I, I think it's just so fascinating that we we continue to on this journey of discovery on earth while we you know go forth on our discovery of of our planetary system and the stars and I, I think it's a bit of a philosophical, perhaps a bit of a philosophical question, but I must ask it. Do you think the answer to the question of who we are and how we've got here and why we exist, do you think you'll find any clues if you figured out how life as we know it came into being or how how that, that spark of creation, is that is that going to solve the puzzle if you identify the spark of creation? in that cauldron that formed life right so so i would i would term it as how did that change from inanimate to animate hmm. happen right how did the that change happen and yes if we understand that then it will perhaps help us understand ourselves better the purpose better hmm. but it may also be possible that life is just a physical process um, okay. You know, uh, so so you know about Gibbs free energy minimization, right? Gibbs free energy minimization is like um, uh, if you have a certain chem chemical, say chemical mm -hmm. composition, they right. will form mineral mineral assemblages based on right. the minimization of the Gibbs free energy. So right. here also, here also the the evolution of life is it related mm -hmm. to some sort of an energy barrier optimization that 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 cause that causes it to go a certain way and there's some work in the last 10 years from mm. mit which um hints at that again again so we don't do not understand but um mm. this is the most pressing and perplexing problem um that um it is we are nowhere close to solving um, because all the evidence has been lost, um, our ability to go to other galaxies is almost zero. Um, yeah. So, because it's so far away, um, yeah. it's just a very perplexing problem. As to, um, but it's a fascinating problem because it's a, it's. I think it's a question that has existed perhaps for a very, very long time ever since we could look up at the stars and wonder at what they were. Yes, it's a very fascinating problem. It's absolutely the most difficult problem uh, as to um, how life evolves. Even the evolution, we do not understand. As to yeah, because it and, and I was I was about to ask you that because it's one thing to kind of try and answer the question of or solve the problem of the spark of life, the spark of creation. It's another to discover why certain uh, single-celled living things can evolve into multiple-celled organisms and why why some do and others don't. Right. So so the single-celled organism that you're saying, so um, this transition, if I'm not mistaken, happened around 2,000 or 2,200 million years. So it's all of a sudden, single celled life changed into multiple celled life so how will that happen on a uh, on a level see each one was independent each single cell was independent yeah then suddenly uh, right now see look at our human body there are cells for smell there are cells for uh, epidermis there are cells for specialized cells for everybody so now there was a there's an arrangement of cooperation how did it, that first develop then um and we don't have a good answer we can look at stromatolites and see that well how does stromatolite colonies work and maybe that gives a hint but um the problem with the geologic record is that it is always incomplete 
but these are un uh, then going forward if you look at the evolution um land based life is very recent yeah i think sure. up, up to 500 million years life was sea based what yeah. caused it to come to land to come out on land yes come out on land then um uh what caused i mean what caused human beings for example to go and become bipeds uh, or human ancestors right um, mm. so these are very perhaps that is the easier question to answer than the multi single cell to multi cell mm. um, transition but there are so many things about us and where we come from um, that we do not understand um, <laughs> Yeah, and that's a brilliant segue into my next question. Where do we come from? And how do we know that we didn't uh, come from something like an asteroid that crashed into Earth, just like this uh, meteoroid crashed into Mars? Did, but, did, did life on Earth as it is and has evolved, mm -hmm. did it perhaps originate somewhere else in the universe or in right. our planetary so we, system or Mars? Which is what I was just saying, that in, it could have come from Mars as well, right? So we don't yeah. know. If Mars had Earth-like conditions, so the Earth, the first 500 years, it was very volcanic um, and it was very hot. The surface was very hot. Mars, unlike Earth in the first 500 million years, was had water and oceans. So there's a possibility that, well, it could have been transported. And I don't know how. Was it by meteorites? And again, we are limiting our discussion to Earth and Mars, right? Right. But if you look at Europa, yeah, all the um, many of the satellites in the outer solar system of Jupiter and Saturn, um, they have water under the crust. How much water? Maybe as much as the Pacific Ocean. So there wow. is actually water below the crust at Europa, hmm. and so. Um, and you would say, well, it's a dark ocean, right? But oceans on Earth are dark after one kilometer, right? Yeah. So, so the next thing that perhaps we are interested in, and my colleagues at planetary science are interested in, is there microscopic life at present, not the past, in the oceans of Europa? And there's a Europa Clipper mission going um, in in the next couple of years right mm. so so that is the frontier so life does not have to be restricted to earth and mars they could be microscopic life in the oceans of europa who knows oh, that would be fascinating I, I guess that would raise i don't know if if just if that's going to raise so many more questions about life each discovery right. each subsequent step in our in our process of discovery tends to raise so many more questions about it 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 does it seems as if you know in public discourse you know, oh that's when we if we figure out um you know the spark of life the spark of creation we'll know why we exist right, i guess okay. that's it's not as simple as that is it no it's not it's not see if you look at textbooks and popular science books um, the story that is told there is very simplified. And I think as scientists, as I said, you know, every, every, everything has qualifiers and probabilities. And some things are not that simple. So a clean that there was a prebiotic soup, that's the cauldron that you're referring to. That's yeah. the most popular theory, prebiotic soup. You have all these ingredients and you have lightning and then somehow life, the first cells form. So it may not be that linear so um yeah sure so so i think um it's knowledge is very complex and you know maybe we will have we will learn maybe we will not learn you know yeah. the if you think of human beings what maybe um a thousand years or two thousand years we did not have the ability even for um printing for example, right? No newspapers. Sure, sure. Right, sure. Right. And then. I mean, the first um, book that was mass printed was the Bible. Right. So, and I don't know that. I don't know when it, when that happened. But it was somehow in the last 500, 700 years, there was yeah. mass printing. Right. Yeah. And hu humans did not have telescopes. 
so um and and then going forward um uh we don't know what is humans evolved if we say well human ancestors evolved 100000 years ago how long will the human race survive so the earth is hmm. 44.5 billion years old humans have been there just for um say 50000 years they if you consider which human ancestor um yeah defines this right so how how long will they survive when will the environment become too hostile for humans to survive um there are periods of mass extinction like you know right now uh, for all species we are passing through a period of mass extinction do you know the population of tigers in uh, have gone down by 95% over the yeah. last 100 years of yes. blue whales have gone yeah. gone down by 95% so yeah. there is a period of mass extinction probably in part driven by uh, Right. But I'm not sure if that's a natural. That's the res, the consequence of a natural process of evolution, because a lot of it seems to be uh, human created, um, it's directly or indirectly. Right, right. Um, but if you think about it, in the geologic past, there were many periods of mass extinction. The triggers sure. are different. Maybe you can say that yeah. the trigger is humans now. Yeah, yeah, but um, but um, so so right now we are perhaps if you think that well we're going into global warming, but mm. then there's we are really going to be global cooling after a while. I mean it's it's a it's, it's a, a cycle. Uh, yeah, it inter interglacials and glacials, right? Yeah. So yeah. um, so so it's a very complex, and 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 our, all, all these climate change cycles etc how do do does every species get through it do they survive do mm. they not survive right so so there is we have, it is so complex to predict uh, how evolution happened and what will be the future unfold yeah. um, um, i can't so, but help wonder about these about similar cycles let's say the possibility of uh, of similar cycles on mars um the, the okay so the mars cycle is probably gone Simpler. i mean they 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 lost the atmospheric uh, atmosphere because of a change in um how much uh, because rate of, of an rate event of, yeah event uh, so so yeah, so so will there be another event which causes the atmosphere to form again? That I don't know the answer to. Mm. Mm. Um, but um, could could but humans but, eventually be the factor that kind of sparks the next step in that cycle on Mars? If we if we are responsible for so much of um, so many species uh, being threatened on Earth, could we perhaps play a more positive role in the future of Mars? Um, well, there is a theory out there that if you cause a, um, I forget, but um, uh, if you cause some sort of a magnetic field uh, on top of the atmosphere, then you can stop the atmospheric loss of air. And since the and mantle, how do you create that magnetic field? By human-induced magnetic field, by mm. some ha hardware. Um, but these are like ideas like terraforming mars terraforming mars you're going to have plants on mars yeah. so these are out out there so these but, are you know terraforming mars was sounded like so much of science fiction a few decades back right it's it's it, it's not it's not i mean outside the realm of possibility today right right so you can have plants in a habitation module Exactly, but to but but that is different from actually planting uh, and having plants on Martian. Yeah, soil. you need an atmosphere to sustain it. Right, right. So this is kind of like you know you can have a money plant inside your house, or you can have a few mm. plants inside your house. It's not like you can grow plants outside your house. So you know, I I was just it just um, got me thinking when we were talking about the process of evolution of uh, of humans as a species 
Uh, and I guess this is also a bit more philosophical, but since we're having a wonderful conversation, I thought I'd ask you all the same. Um, so we have our lizard brains, right? And on top of that, there's a layer of, uh, of our uh, neocortex. What is there to, what's the next step, evolutionary step for us in our brains? Is it like an AI mesh over that neocortex that then ultimately takes us to the next evolutionary step or do we fuse with do we fuse with machines do we upload our consciousness into computers and therefore be independent of the human form as we know it so you know this sounds really like science fiction <laughs> so if you think about what the situation on earth is right right um so this is you're talking of human brains meshing with computers and all that right so it's very good to <laughs> <laughs> to think, think about, about it. it think about it but if you look at a stark statistic yeah uh if you look at the human race as a whole where are we right right where are we are we how different are we from the stone age etc right so, hmm. so you give me the metric of how many people um, are able to afford food. You give me the statistic. Indeed. How many people? Indeed. There are millions going hungry. No, no. You tell. Give me as a percentage. Uh, of, I would say maybe about eighty um, percent or 70% that can afford some sort of sustenance. And how much can, so some from some form of sustenance. So I'm, some form uh, of sustenance. Uh, so you're saying, um, and so, so me, that means that their level is such that they can not have all the food items, but some of the food items. Yes. For example, they may, may not be able to have um, non-vegetarian, but. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking in very basic terms as a, as a minimum, calorific value of uh, right. daily See, intake which which need not necessarily be regular right. because the realities right. of for millions of people across the world is that you know forget food they don't even have access to safe drinking water to begin with right so i think the number that you mentioned 20 percent is too optimistic i think probably you have to go to the world bank site to find out what is the i think it is even more dire and so I think the human race at some point is um, um, don't doesn't have the very basic necessities, and all these things are constrained. All these ideas will be constrained, and if implemented, will affect a very little fraction of the human race. Okay, coming back to Neuralink, this is yeah. the Elon Musk company, right? They're trying to. But um, it's not this research, uh, Dr. Ghosh, is not new. Right, human right. brain interface research has been on for at least a couple of decades if not more yes and, and i tell you what the problem is here so you you can track neurons being fired so you can see that some sort of a signal is going through hmm. but and it, the brain is like a computer it's just that we don't know what the signal is that is going through so we cannot figure out what the algorithm is and so um you can so it's very hard to understand that if we understood that part we would understand the brain and uh, which what elon musk is trying to do right you, you can upload a hard yeah, drive and, to your and brain, a whole lot right? of other and a whole lot of other scientists as well have been trying right, not just right, musk right. so that is that is what the, yeah. that is what right so all yeah. these uh, to succeed the it has to be a tangible benefit and um yeah. it has to be have an economic model Exactly. That the customer uh, that the customer wants it yeah. and um and you mentioned ai right ai is actually just a numerical method which is used in uh very select cases where the data allows mm. so yeah. it, it is not um so i would argue that human intelligence is much more stronger than ai so um so in a way you well, can you certainly say that hope we, so if we are if we are to ensure our survival, it had better be. Or we find a way to control AI. And there are a lot of serious questions around that. Uh, that yes. 
right, right. pretty Absolutely. scary. Right, right. And I want to come back to the question about the future of of the rover program because it's by far the most successful human endeavor that we have seen in terms of space exploration. What's the next evolutionary step for the rovers? I mean, we've we've seen ingenuity, the helicopter. What what are we still going to uh, continue with a few more iterations of the of the rover platform, or are we going to see a move towards bigger fleets, some autonomous, some semi-autonomous? See, I think the next step would be to um, get samples back, which is mm. what's happening, um, yeah. and to study them for uh, possible clues to life. And then the next big leap would be landing humans on Mars. And that mm. may happen um, somewhere in the 2030s. Um, so, yeah. but there's so, but in the in in the interim, Doctor Ghosh, mm -hmm. I, I guess mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get at is is landing human humans on Mars is still a very big if, right? Mm -hmm. Right. The the supporting technology needs to do a lot of of um, of go through a lot of evolutionary steps, and there's there's a whole suite of technologies that you need in order to sustain a human being on Mars. It's a lot less of uh, you know uh, complexity in terms of technology to get a rover on Mars, to to get a the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. Do you see other forms of uh, of rovers? Maybe I mean you've you've seen the the um, the Boston Dynamics, and I'm going to just add this to the stream. This is the Boston Dynamics Spot robot. Um, do you see a future where robots like this could be part of a fleet um, that, as I said, is before a far a long time before humans ever get there? Maybe even humanoid robots. And we've seen uh, Boston Dynamics do a lot of work with humanoid robots, humanoid robots. We're also seeing some very interesting work by Tesla. Uh, of course, um, this is more AI driven, and this is their Optimus bot. So, you also have to consider the fact um, that the humanoid form is a process, uh, is a is is a product of evolution that is best suited to the human need to explore, survive, and thrive. And a humanoid robot would, by nature, be able to be a lot more dexterous and evolve and adapt to a situation than let's say a rover would you agree and then therein is is that the future of uh, of robotic space exploration before we even get to humans on a, on a planet like ours so um see it's very difficult to say whether rovers will be part or not part of the next um 10 years of space exploration. I'm, I'm assuming other. Let's just assume it takes videos. us. It takes us. It takes us 15 years to get humans on Mars. Right. From now. So, from now to that so, time. Right. How do we so take the, our exploration forward? So, the Earth is not the only place. Sorry, the Mars is not the only place where there are interesting problems. So, the mm. next generation there will be missions to Venus. Then there is the Europa Clipper. Then, um, China has plans india has plans so so it may not all center around mars so and often when you have a very nice technology it is good but you have to relate it and answer a scientific question with it right so for example if i want to detect earthquakes on mars hmm. does a humanoid robot help me Hmm. It doesn't. Hmm. So, so you have to. So the technology is a tool to answer that question. Hmm. So, so for example, you know, on, on the Curiosity rover, we have um, instrument which can measure not only composition of different elements, but also isotopic composition. So it can hmm. say, well, they have you have so much isotope of 
oxygen and so much isotope oxygen 16 and oxygen 17 so hmm. that is the level of sophistication so right. you you make the technology to answer the questions so usually you don't start with the technology and say well what could this answer hmm. you, you know you, know, yeah, you, you, say, you fine you, tune it to a particular need right so when you're making dinner you, your objective is to make dinner your objective is not to find the best use of the toaster yeah right Right, so exactly. it's kind of this. It's very interesting, but you know, in the yeah. real world, you have to choose between other scientific priorities, and these are real taxpayer dollars. So it has to be for sure a real, real question that worth answering. And then, hmm. of course, new technologies always come come in because yeah. the function of new technologies is either to optimize cost or to um, do something which could not have been done before. Which sure. is what you saw saw in uh, in January. It was a yeah. uh, drone. So there's going to be a yeah. drone on t Titan as well. And, yeah. Um, the the um, you know this is going to this is an NASA mission in the pipeline. So. And what is the next evolutionary step in this process of of um, exploration? What comes after you... the rover, or do we just continue with with more complex I... iterations of the rover? <laughs> It is very difficult to say. So first, I think mm. people would want to see, scientists would want to see what comes out of those samples. What mm. do you learn from the samples? And mm. if there's something that you cannot learn, is it worth going back to any specific right. location um, to get more samples or to analyze it even deeper uh, with one of the existing rovers? Or mm. if the, that rover did not have that specific capability, is it worth sending another rover? to that location so it's driven by the discovery and would you say this we'd see a lot more uh forward movement um on this on the moon first and mars later because logistically it's a lot easier to um to achieve a lot of this on the moon on the human exploration part yes but on the robotic exploration i think both mars and moon will move forward hmm. Human, it is much harder to go to Mars. Yeah, I guess, and that's that's. It's not just Mars, but beyond as well. And so right. the question of of the question of um, of the next steps in human evolution. I mean, do we need to find a way to live longer in order to be true space explorers and reach right. that final frontier? So the nearest sun, yeah, is four four light years away, right? Right. And uh, we sent the Voyager mission. Um, it is uh, probably uh, going for about 50 years from 70. Yeah. yeah. Less than 50 years, right? And it has gone only. And it's still going. 20 hours of light time. So to reach, yes. to reach four years of light time. Uh, how much would that mission take? How much time would that mission take? So this is only for the nearest sun, right? Yeah. So so you do the math. Um, so uh, fifty years, if it is um, for fifty years of the spacecraft journey, is equal to one day. So times four hundred is the amount of time it would take. So fifty times four hundred, right? Yeah, um, which it's is um, humanly possible, is, right? So you have to live for that many years, and yeah. then you have to come back. Unfortunately, so you have to live times two, right? Uh, so <laughs> for those who want to, right? But you know there are spores, yeah, actually, which actually have uh, Antarctic spores and other spores, which remain inactive for that long, and then again and longer uh, as well. Yeah. Assume assume lifelike properties afterwards. Well, I hope I uh, I hope we'll get tantalizing uh, hints in the next few decades of what the possible future may be. Absolutely, absolutely. That part I agree because we have new instruments, we have new ways of looking at things. Um, you have new talent, and so obviously, uh, humans will know much more. This voyage of discovery has just started. Indeed, it has. Well. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ghosh. It has been such a pleasure talking to you. I know, I know you said uh, you don't have a lot of time, but I, I guess we've lost track of time. But thank no, you. Absolutely. Thank you so absolutely much. It's a been a pleasure. <laughs> absolutely a pleasure.